Music business priorities and personal tragedy for The Who almost stopped the movie being made. You know, a few weeks before he started filming, Keith Moon died. So there was a point that maybe the film was going to not happen because the record company who were paying for the film to be made wanted, a, wanted new albums from The Who. And without Mooney, would the, would the albums ever come out? We don't know. So at one point we thought the film was going to be cancelled. But the producers, Roy Baird and Bill Kerbishley, he was the manager of The Who. And the two of them, uh, in fact, they're the gentlemen who asked me to do the film. They then uh, held it together. The film got made. Now the ride was back on, how was Rodham going to get his gang of teenage hellraisers together? I didn't want to make a film that was set in an era that the current youth were like uh, abusive towards or thought was crap. Because there you had this punk attitude, this great, so like, let's burn all the bridges, let's throw away all the clothes, let's throw away all the music, let's start again. And there we were making a film that was actually um, about an era that had been abandoned by the you know, hip youth of the day. So I, I looked at it and I, I felt that one that I could, if I made that a very emotionally honest film, it didn't matter what period it was set in. But at the same time, the producer side of me was looking at the point of, well, maybe I should investigate using some of the punk icons of the day so that I create a bridge between the youth of then and the youth of now. And so I investigated um, quite a few guys who were in the punk, uh, or kind of around the periphery of punk. I mean, one of the people I met was with uh, Johnny Rotten. And, uh, and I thought Johnny could play this role. He's a disenfranchised youth. My first meeting with Frank Rodden was he called me to a pub to meet Johnny Rotten and asked me to get Johnny Rotten through the screen test at Shepperton for the role of Jimmy. I went round to Johnny's flat and we ran through everything. We went to Shepperton, we did the screen test, which I thought Johnny Rotten was fucking brilliant. Unfortunately, that screen test has been lost. I wish I had the insight to keep it because he was quite good. He was conscientious, he knew his lines, he was on the ball. But then... Um, Frank gave me a phone call about two weeks later and said, I'm really sorry, but, you know, the insurers won't insure Johnny. They'd seen him spitting on the photographs of the Queen, you know, you know, you know cutting people up, puking up. Here. They thought, this guy, we can't rely on this guy to turn up 60 days in a row on a set. I mean, he might, just, he might just blow the investment. So they wouldn't let me use him. I had a very good casting director, uh, Patsy Pollock. And one of the first people she brought in was Phil Daniels. He said, Phil is a fantastic actor, see Phil. I think he came on the first day, but he, he just, this is a very funny thing, he'd just come back from South Africa making a Zulu 2, and he'd been sick. And when he came in, there was this scrawny kid came in, but he had the, I've never seen anybody with a coat of yellow on his tongue that I've ever made. I almost died when I saw it. I thought, this guy looks so ill, I, and, and, you know, I couldn't even look at him. I got some sort of African disease and I did an audition and it wasn't very good. I was kind of just washed out. So I went back and did another one and that was a lot better, I think. And I saw Phil this time and he looked better, you know, he's, you know his tongue was clean and he looked well and healthy and he was great. And then he did this performance, which is just fantastic. And I knew, this, I knew I could really work with him and we were going to be great partners. So I consider Phil, you know, a, a partner in this movie. He helped create it with me. There were about, um, I think, eight or nine of us that were screen tested for Jimmy, the part that Phil Daniels played. And... Um, you know, there were three or four scenes organised and uh, we went in and did them once they were lit. And so we were hanging out in the, in the green room. Phil was there, Johnny Rotten, I can't remember who else. And I was slightly disappointed that I, I didn't get to play Jimmy. But, you know, Chalky was a great role and I was, I was really, really chuffed to be in it. It was the film that everybody wanted to be in, you know. We all knew it was going to be made. We were all huge Who fans. We loved the album. It was hugely exciting to be part of it. I started turning up outside Frank's office at, at Wembley um, and banging on the window and saying, look, you haven't cast Monkey, what, what are you going to do about this? I'll play Monkey. So I pestered and pestered and then eventually Frank got me into the office and I did the scene with Phil Daniels, which is the pill-popping, snogging scene. Anything cool? Oh, let's have some. Oh, come on, Monkey, don't mess about. Mm, not unless you give me some. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you always have to ask, don't you? 
I went home, still didn't hear anything from Frank, so I started turning up at his office again. And Pester Power got me the job because he couldn't find anyone else to play Monkey. We ran away, I got called back two days later, had this sort of little interview, and offered me the job on the spot. And then trooped in the rest of the cast. Finally, I had this wonderful group of people. I had about 40 or 50 people, which were the core of my film. Some of them became the top six lead roles, some of them became the secondary characters, and some of them became special extras. But they were all together all the time. We, we were quite a wild gang. Everything that we did from then on was to make us a gang. And we went off to parties in the East End of London um, where we met real mods who were still mods. Uh, no gay crashes. Gay crashes? Hello, this is cool. Gay crashes. You didn't even have the courtesy to bring any rockers. <laughs> And we met some rockers as well, but you know these people in the 40s who were still living the modern rocker dream. We were living it at the time, so that was you know that's why the film looks so good and looks like that people aren't acting really. If Rodham's told you any true stories about some of the things he got us to do before we did filming about going to an old mod's house and taking drugs and, and things like that, I mean there was all sorts of stuff we did that you know, got us into the mood of it. They brought in a traditional film choreographer, but she was being a ballet mistress, so she couldn't really teach them how to do mod dances. So I got this guy from the street, a DJ called Jeff Dexter, and um, he was fantastic, so we had him working alongside the choreographer. Then taught us sort of authentic, sort of 60s dances, which we sort of tried to emulate in the film. Sting was a terrible dancer. But if you notice, it's all shot sort of there on him. Great dancer, anyway. Yeah. He must be the ace face, eh? Good looking. Because he was so perfect and so beautiful and so clever, we just relentlessly took the piss out of him. And he took it really well. One day they put on his, uh, on the call sheet, they put Gordon Sumner down instead of Sing, Sting. So everybody found out his name was Gordon. Everybody started singing, Gordon is a moron. I don't think he was too happy. That's what I remember. Oh, look at him. Don't he look smart? Sting could not ride a scooter. Have you then we told you that? You know, like on the old... He couldn't... He kept wanting to put his feet down. So he, he struggled. I like people to be skilled in the things they're supposed to be doing. I like, uh, if the guys are supposed to ride motorbikes, I like them to be ride well. So I got them motorbikes and scooters a month before we started shooting. I don't think you could make that film these days. You know, you're gonna give your main cars, motorbikes, to ride around London, to go and tear around. One of my first images is Leslie Ash going arse over tit off a scooter because she, she, I think she used the brake to accelerate and it kind of flipped her. We were tearing around this track, all showing off, trying to go faster than each other, you know. And the scooters were, were tricky, you know, my one had all those mirrors in it. And we had to have three because I used to come off so often. We went to Hendon Police uh, Place and got taught by some big fat copper how to ride our bikes who used to get Leslie Ash on the back because he fancied her. I mean, when you're about 19, they're the best bitch, you know what I mean? Free bike rides and all that, so we quite enjoyed all that. That rehearsal period was, was, was great fun. I mean, there I was, I was, you know, th three months before I was living in this little sort of village in Portsmouth, and then we were rehearsing dance sequences above a strip club in Soho, getting into cars, getting driven out to, to Harrow, taking scooter riding lessons, going out with each other at night times, going to the Southgate royalty and, and hanging around in places, meeting old mods, and it was, it was sort of an extraordinary thing to do. 
The whole experience from getting the job to filming was all about absorption and, and being immersed in the lifestyle. And we worked to create this group of, group of friends that were in the, in the film and uh, to establish, you know, that people fall into types. You know, who was this type of person and who was that type of person. Um, you know, over and above what was written on the, on the printed page. But it became more and more obvious as we were filming that the story was going to be more of almost a documentary about Phil's character, about Jimmy. Well, the, the thing with Jimmy is there's, there's an extra thing taking place with Jimmy because, yes, he wants to be the, the, the mod, but he doesn't have all the the best attributes for the mod. He's not the tallest, or most beautiful looking guy. He doesn't have the best job. He doesn't have the money. Uh, he doesn't necessarily, go, he isn't necessarily going to get the girl that he likes. He is the boy next door, isn't he? Because he's not a superhero or a hero of any kind, except he's just normal. And that's what makes him work, I think. Look, I ain't mad, you know. What is wrong with you then? Well, I don't know. It's just, it just, it seems like everything's going backwards. That's all, Steph. You sure it's not you that's going backwards? He's like you and me, you know. We're always three rows back, you know, trying to. And he, you know, he falls in love with the wrong girl, and he's not hip enough for her. And that's what it's about, you know. You hit the hit the real world with a crash. There is a political aspect to the film, which is my own aspect that I brought to it, which is I was very concerned that um, if you run with the mob, you get carried away with bad ideas. Even though you admire the group and what the group is doing, you must think as an individual, you must stand up for your own morality and your own, your own, your own ideas. Because in the end, those guys are going to drag you towards violence or drag you towards drugs or drag you towards something which actually you should give up. Jimmy's character was the kind of character that all women in, in that environment would have been drawn to and Monkey was just, you know, kind of following the, the gang as it were. He was um, an independent person, a bit of a loner, and someone that would probably end up breaking away from the gang when the crunch comes to a crunch. In a way, he goes into the movement, and the disappointment of you know, his level of achievement moves him towards um, you know, looking at the movement and seeing what is wrong with the movement. Get running now! Keep my lip button down! Baggage out. Boy. Boy. That's what the film's about, you know. Waking up into a grey, bleak reality. Making a film as unique as Quadrophenia was never going to be straightforward or easy but Rodham had a few tricks up his sleeve. When they contracted me to do the film, it was June. We were going to film at the end of September. There was no script and no casting, so we were going to do everything at the same time, which is actually a fantastic way to work. We were refining the script. We said, we're making this movie. We know it's going to work. We're going to get the script right. And uh, we are going to uh, get the casting right. We're going to get the locations right. We're on. The first sequence was down in Brighton. Um, I think the first few days was just Phil on his own riding the... The, the scooter for the last sequence. Had enough of living, had enough of had enough of There's a lot to be said, I think, for doing the end of the film first, for an actor, because you know where you've got to go. There I know where I'm going to end my part, so then I can build up to that. So, you know, sometimes you start somewhere and you don't quite know where you're going. Um, I just remember, I think I went a bit too close to the edge because like, I was a bit too keen in those days, but, uh, yeah, I just like riding the scooters about, basically. Somebody told me, some old director or art director said, you know, they always run out of money on films. You know, if you've got a big ending, shoot it first, which was great for me. So I shot my ending first, which is the scooter going off the cliff. <laughs> And I didn't know how to do it, but the art director and the stunt coordinator said, well, you know, they built this big, uh, they built this big ramp, um, and they had a pulley, and they had the scooter on this big ramp, 
and uh, uh, 